I would go with my dad on the truck. And we're going over the Bay Bridge. And his trucks then were these old gas, white, they weren't diesels. They didn't have a lot of power. They had to shift a lot of gears to get anywhere. And we're climbing up the Bay Bridge. It wasn't much of a climb, but for this, these trucks loaded with us, they'd be shifting gears. What you have to do with these two boxes, you shift, you're in, say you're in, in third gear in the main box, and you got a three or four speed brownie box, and you shift that one three or four times, whatever it had, and then you're coming down, you're climbing a hill, so you got to shift this one over into second gear and the brownie back to first gear. You got to do all that before you lose your momentum. So he got so he could put his arm through the steering wheel, grab the brownie and that main box and shift once, hit the clutch and bang, put them both in at the same time, you know. Oh, and the truck would roar and just keep on going. Uh, he was pretty talented, you know. And nowadays we get trucks that uh, are automatic transmission. Automatics like my last one was. Or single gearbox that any fool can drive, you know. But that took some real experience to drive those then. But uh, I don't know if I ever learned to do, like, the, I, I could do a version of it, but I, could, I don't remember if I got good enough to do it as well as my dad. My, my mom tells the story of he, she was with him once on the truck. They're going across the tracks and the truck stalls, and here comes a train. She says, Dad calmly started the truck, because if he had pushed it, it would have flooded, and they never would have got started. She's watching, here comes the train, he starts it up, gets it going, puts it in gear, and gets off just in time, either forward or backwards, to miss the train, and she's thinking she's going to die, you know. But you had to, you had to be cool, or you're going to kill it, and then you are dead, you know. Uh, Do you remember when back in, uh, when you, a couple of years before you moved down the house in Cali, when me and Alex, when we came to California, you would take us out on the, the truck and we'd spend a day of work with you. Alex, especially when I would haul that paper pulp, he loved it. He'd climb inside and as I'm yeah. unloading, he'd dive off into the pile. You know, he loved that. I thought, ooh, no, but it's just paper pulp. It wasn't nasty or anything. But. Sure had a weird smell to it, though. Never smelled that anywhere else. Well, it, 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 it rots. It's great compost. It rots because it's wet cardboard. I remember one time we were, you know, I was helping you move it, put it to his conveyor belt so it can go down. And I didn't realize it, but I was on the conveyor belt and I, you know, I was just trying to get it from the side. Fell off. And then the sound you made was, Kawaii! That was your sound. And because you thought I was dead or something. And I'm like, I'm okay. And my, like, you know, <sighs> Matthew would just get in the truck. Yeah, that's all I need to do is squish one of my grandkids out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would have been my belt trailer, my last one, which was a real nice trailer. Real. Yeah. Worked good. I like, just I, remember your walking floor. Yeah. Da, da, da. Click, click, click. It, it worked, though. My mom told me about going on the truck with my dad. And this is the days you didn't have women truck drivers. Just didn't happen. First of all, you didn't have power steering, you had a great big steering wheel. And your arms got strong from turning that thing, you know. All right, going straight, but you had to back it up. You better have some muscle or you weren't going to get anywhere. And uh, she was in the truck and he needed to sleep, so she got behind the wheel. And she's driving down the, the highway like that. I don't know if it was a freeway or not, probably just an old highway, you know. And just scared to death. Then she'd see another truck coming the other way, and just before he got there, she'd hold with one hand and lean out the window like this. Hi, you know. <laughs> the driver would go, what? Then <laughs> she'd hold on the steering wheel again and drive. <laughs> I, I, well, I was a kick, you know. She, uh, she taught me how to double clutch a truck. You know, I did it. She used to drive a school bus for a while and had to double clutch it. Didn't have synchro mesh gears. So. <laughs> So was that uncommon back then for uh, women to... Very. Uh, you never saw a woman in a truck driving a truck, even hardly riding in a truck. But she uh, she tells that story with, with a flourish.
I was just so young. My dad used to drive so long. They didn't have log books then. You drove until you died, you know, until you couldn't drive anymore. And he would put in endless hours driving. And I'm coming back with him from a, a load somewhere far away. And we're coming back, and, and I'm looking at him, his eyes open here. I didn't realize his other one was closed. He was driving with one eye asleep. And there goes our turn off. I guess he's taking the next one. He took that one. I said, Hey, Daddy. He goes, Whoa, what? 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 <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> he was shifting gears and everything, sound asleep, you know, going down the road. He would have he would have gone until he ran out of fuel, I guess. But that, those were tough days, and I I got in at the tail end of that. I put in big hours when I first started, came back and helped them on there. I didn't have to keep log books or anything. I was I took a I came in like a typical week. I'd come in at like two or three in the morning and pick up my load and go deliver it, and load another load and deliver it all day long come back and they'd have a load for LA loaded for me and I'd hook onto that and head to LA. I'd been up virtually all night anyway and I'm driving all night long to get to LA, get there just in time to unload and go across town and reload and come on back. And I'm, see we, I had the new truck and dad said that truck's going to keep going to pay for it. He was scared to death. He had spent $27,000 for that truck and that was a lot of money. And uh, so I kept it going. And I'm coming back one day, I'd been up 40 hours straight, I figured, without sleep driving. And I'm going down Highway 5. They just opened Highway 5. There was nothing on Highway 5 between the Grapevine and, and uh, 680. Highway 5 or Interstate 5? Interstate 5. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, they didn't have service stations, they had nothing. And I'm going along, driving, and after about 40 hours, and, and I'm just dragging. And I saw this 51 Chevy with a black top and gray bottom. I can almost remember the license plate number. Skid out in front of me and roll over and catch on fire. And I hit the brakes, come to a roar and stop, and there's nothing there. <laughs> it was just a dark spot in the road that I saw, you know, and I'm hallucinating. I decided I'd be a little late for that delivery and pulled over and slept for a little bit. But I never slept in the sleeper. If I crawled back in the sleeper, I knew I wouldn't wake up for hours. So I just pull over a safe spot and lay over the steering wheel and sleep. The thing is, somewhere along that, that uh, time of sleeping, probably for about 15, 20 minutes or so, I'd wake up enough to realize I was at the steering wheel and I'd fallen asleep. I figured I was driving, scared me to death, you know, jump up. Uh. Well, now I'm awake, I can go for another hundred miles, you know. I had all this adrenaline, you know. So that's how I had pushed myself to keep going. <laughs> there was one week before we had kids, I got home four hours out of the whole week. Just enough to change and shower and go again. Uh, I was running up as far north as Crescent City, as far south as a little Calexico, they call it, right on the border where they made sheetrock. I just run and run and run. Calex was just a name for right there between the border of California and Mexico? Yeah, or there's is a that town, Calexico. And I think on the other side of the border there's a Mexicali, but on this side it's Calexico. It's, so it's actually called that, not yeah. just a tongue in cheek thing. No, that's what it's called. And there's a big sheetrock plant there. I picked up sheetrock. And I remember coming back. These are cab over trucks, you know. They, they had to make them small to conform with the length limits. They changed that now, so you see nothing but conventional trucks with a lot of room for the driver. I'm coming back with this truck from Calexico, and a sandstorm hits. And it hits so hard that this is a powerful truck and I can't get over 35 miles an hour going into it, you know. I figured it sandblasted all the paint off the truck, you know, it had to. Uh, it, it had didn't, apparently, but uh, I remember how hard it was to come back and drive against that. Certainty closed out this uh, one roofing product. It was... Uh, what was it called? Um, 
it was a, a skinny, slippery roll that they used on stucco houses they put around. And they weren't going to make it anymore. So they had sold the last of it to this guy in San Diego. And so I came in, and I brought in all this extra rope and everything. And I was scared to death of this load because you see them falling over all the time. Guys don't tie them just right. They take a load a corner too fast, they just fall over. So I'd had them, I told them which forklift driver I wanted. I didn't want anyone but him because I knew he'd get it right. And we loaded four pallets, and then I would I'd put the V-boards on, cross tie them like that, then four more pallets and V-board and cross tie them both sides, so each one was a tight little bundle all the way down, both trailers. Then we had to put the double deck on, same thing, except it was set back to about a half a pallet from the front to a half a pallet from the back, so, uh, so it straddled. Stacking bricks. Yeah, it straddled, straddled the pallets below them. Staggered. And uh, when I got all done looking at that thing, it looked like a black set of vans. <laughs> and I took it to San Diego. I must have stopped 20 times to check the ropes, make sure they were tight. And not one came loose. Not one did I have to re-tighten all the way down there. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. And I got down there, got the ropes off and everything. This guy with his forklift starts stacking it on his, his cement pad. And he was coming back, and the whole thing went, Phew, and his pad fell over. You know, he was mad, but, you know, it wasn't on my truck. You know. And then I got all this rope together, rolled it up. I filled all the boxes on the trailers, the side box on the tractor, and then in the front of the seat with rope, and it filled up to the windshield back onto the seat. That's how much rope I had used. But I got it there. Now, V-boards, are those like... Uh Couple one by fours, two eight, eight foot one by fours with a, nails together. a strap yeah. together to hold them. So you put it up there on the corners like that, and then the ropes that would hold it in, and also keep your ropes from damaging the, the roofing or whatever you're hauling. But uh, that was one of the scariest loads I'd ever hauled, and I was very proud that I made it all the way to San Diego without losing it. I uh, I took you you know you know uh, uh, oh, who's your cousin or maybe he's my cousin uh, I just saw in California uh, Rod no Steve that's right Steve. Uh, Steve Rain, well, or Steve Humphrey. I was going to say, I thought it's Steve Humphrey. Yeah, Steve Humphrey. Uh, when he was just a little kid, about like David's age or something, or maybe a little bit younger, I took him on a trip to L.A. with me. Uh, I don't know why, but I did. And uh, we were coming back with our load, and suddenly he says, I gotta pee, I gotta pee. I said, hey, we can't pull over here, it's on a freeway with no shoulders or anything. I said, you just gotta hold it, I can't, I can't. Finally he peed his pants. <laughs> I remind him of this all the time. And so we had to go down the road to a truck stop in there and get him showered and I washed his clothes in the washer and dryers I had there and he came home. But uh, he gets embarrassing by the time I relate that story. I think that's great to embarrass him. <laughs> no, I, uh, I really loved driving a truck when I was young. I enjoyed the challenge, and uh, I was—I felt I was a good driver, a safe driver. Never had an accident for driving a truck for about 40 years, on and off. Uh, until you moved to Roy. Until what? Until you moved to Roy. Yeah, well, I wasn't with a truck either, with a car and snow. But uh, I didn't hear about him getting in an accident. I. Uh, but then. After everything changed and we lost everything, I started over again with one truck and two trailers, and I had to get back in that truck again. It was scared me to death. But I didn't like driving a truck anymore. Now it was beneath me, I guess. I don't know. But I didn't. I felt embarrassed to be in a truck driver after all those years, starting at 50 years old and starting over. 
I figure the scariest one would have to be that day, though, when you couldn't figure out how to put the thing together. Yeah. And then you go in and, you, and it's all grinding gears when you're trying to shift. Yeah, well, that's when, in 1996, we lost everything. Lost $10 million, lost the property down there. I thought it was a little later than that. No, I was in 96. And, uh, that would be before I was in high school. Anyway, anyway, and uh, the stress was so high. We were on church assistance for about six months because I couldn't work. I had to put these corporations to bed properly. I'd sell assets, try to make deals, pay people off and stuff. And uh, uh, Sylvia worked three part-time jobs to try to keep us in something, some money with church assistance and that. And uh, what was her jobs? Huh? School teacher. Oh, yes. Or she she subs. I'm sorry. She was a substitute. And she had a job going around checking uh, service station prices. Yeah, that used to be Micah's job. And then she had another one she did. But uh, I, when I got that all settled, then I had this one account left, uh, George Pacific, the paper pulp, and I had an old truck and two old trailers. So I got in the truck, started hauling it. But. I got. I used to park the trailer out on a different street and bring the truck home uh, there in Susun. Yeah, I thought you parked it over on Prosperity. That's in Susun. Well, it's no uh, over there. Uh, I mean, just past our house, Prosperity. No, I parked it over well, right next to Highway 12. That street. Oh, oh by the gas station. The, yeah, okay, I know where you're talking about. Oh, I remember yeah. four locations. Again. And so I, I came out there one day. Disneyland I, is one of them. I backed under the trailer and went out to hook it up, and I couldn't remember how to hook it up. Now, I've been hooking it up since I could barely walk and go with Dad, hooking the airlines up and that. I had to stop and figure it all out again, get it all, and where everything went, and... Then I went down the road and I was grinding gears for the first five miles or so. I couldn't shift anymore. I used to never thought about it before. And it scared me so bad that when I got home, we called the doctor and, and they did an MRI. And it uh, turned out I'd had some mini strokes. Did you eat dinner like Adam did? They found these little black marks on my brain. So those are mini strokes. Not chocolate chips. No. I think I lost about a third of my vocabulary because I had trouble pulling up the words that I used to use all the time. And uh, so you had you were able to skip from like seventh grade to like tenth or something. No, I didn't. I didn't skip any. But in ninth grade they tested us all, and I was the second highest in the whole school for reading and comprehension. Some girl beat me because. Because I used to, at junior high, when these guys would beat you up if you were out there on the playground, it was a bad school. <laughs> it was painted the same color as San Quentin and deserved it. And, uh, these guys would be 18 years old and in junior high still flunking, you know, and they won't walk around and beat you up. So I'd stay up in the library and read all through my lunch hour. So I would read about seven books a week. And I would just grab one off the shelf. I read everything from Space Cat to Hemingway, For Whom the Bell Tolls. I just, whatever I had, I read. And uh, Micah was a fan of Space Cat. Was he? But, uh, I've even seen Space Cat. Because of that, I had uh, an immense vocabulary. And I had, uh, uh, but I, so we, in, in the first year of high school, they would separate your English into two parts. Half would be uh, English grammar, and half would be English literature. Not old English, but, you know, literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would get A's in literature and D's in, in grammar, so I'd get a C and pass, no problem. And uh, I remember... The teacher assigned a book report once, and I turned mine in, and he showed it to the class. He gave me an A on it, but it was totally covered in red ink for corrections. But I had done it just the way he wanted it, and 
I was the good example of the, <laughs> of the student in that class that day. But uh, so when I got to college, I came to BYU. They gave you tests to see if you had to go to Bonehead English or Bonehead Math or something like that. And I was able to I was able to get good enough grades in the English that I didn't have to take remedial English just because of my vocabulary, you know, and, and my reading and, and syntax. I could read something and know if it was right or not, not knowing why. I couldn't diagram a sentence or anything like that. I didn't know a noun from a verb, but I knew what sounded right, and so I, I got by on that. Passed them. So, anyway, after that, uh, the Spanish strokes, it... Uh, it was, it was scary for a while. My, I guess my blood pressure had gone way up and the stress level was huge and I hadn't had any checkups and that. Otherwise, they would have caught it sooner. And, uh, but uh, it was an awakening, you might say. And then I built that business up at, after I was 50 years old starting over until I was with that one truck working four days a week, just me driving it, not 38 employees this time, but I was grossing $300,000 or so a year. And, you know, uh, maybe uh, at most 50% cost. So I was making good money. So I was able to put together a plan for retirement so that I could retire when I, when I got, uh, I don't know, was I about 60 or so. Then we moved to Utah. But uh, and you moved to Utah in two thousand two or something. Like that. I don't remember what year we moved. Do you? It was like five years ago now. I moved here in two thousand two. We spent two years in Roy, and then we've been here almost four. So it's been almost six years, right? Six years here. And I and I've been living here for seven, almost eight. If Ezra had stayed in the Army, you know where we'd be living now? Washington. No. Nope. Missouri. Missouri. In the Ozarks. In the Ozarks. We made a couple trips to the Ozarks. We loved that place down in southern Missouri. Cheapest property in the whole United States. I was really hot on this one piece that had a two-bedroom house and a one-bedroom guest house and a combination swimming fishing pond with a floating dock and a barn and a good place for a lake down below to build that I would have built uh, on 80 acres for 125000 And the property taxes were $200 a year, whereas this house, it's 300 and some dollars a month. That's the difference. That would have been an excellent place to retire to. But then Ezra got out of the Army and moved to Utah with all my grandkids, so... Prior to that, though, they said, oh, we're going to move to Oregon or Washington. That's where we want to be. So instead of, instead of the Ozarks, we ran up there and bought five acres on the Washougal River, and I started improving it. I, I built a road into it there and cleared an area for the house, and uh, I was all ready to go. Then Ezra got his vision and said, we need to move to Utah. So... There went that, so we moved here. What, what, what happened? Did, some, did somebody eventually buy that property? Or yeah, yeah I sold it to clothes? my neighbor up there. Ah, yes. that's right. I remember I was trying to sell it online for a while. I only got what I paid for it because prices had dropped. I was lucky to sell it for what I paid for it without the improvements. But uh, that would have been a beautiful place to have a home, too. Or the place just down in Uinta. But I think the people in Utah are nicer than the people in Washington by a pretty good margin. They welcome you here, wherever you're from. In Washington, if you had California plates, they'd key your car. they so go back home to California. They didn't want Californians up there because they were raising the cost of housing and everything. Of course, these were people that had moved earlier from California that didn't want you to move there. But still... Yeah. It was it was a nice place, but uh, now you'd be visiting us in the Ozarks. Was your hometown always California? 
Well, I was born in Palo Alto, California in 1945, just before the baby boom. The, of, before the Depression? No. After the Depression. Uh, before, after World War II. Yeah. The world the was depressed boom. when he was born, yes. <laughs> the, uh, after World War II, all the soldiers came home and he had a bunch of babies. That's the baby boom. Well, of course. Because, you know, I was, I was born just before that. So I just ahead of the baby boom, but uh, yeah, and then we I was raised in Richmond, California. The first place in Richmond my folks lived was in old war housing. It was a nasty place, but I was a little kid. I didn't know. I didn't care. And, Is that uh, like a, an apartment complex? Type apartment of? complexes, more. They just were cruddy apartments, but government housing. Yeah, it was just uh, projects, and that's where the story of uh, my mom comes in. She was living there when Dad had his one truck, and he was out uh, contract hauling. And I remember one night he came home pulling an ice, a refrigerated van full of ice cream, and he brought in this ice cream. We all got ice cream, and I couldn't believe after. One ice cream cone, um, ice cream bar. We'd ate all the ice cream in that truck. I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't very old, you know. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, my dad, got ulcers, and they put him in the hospital. And in those days, they thought ulcers were caused by worry and stress. But now they find out it's a bacterial thing. But so they told mom when she'd come to visit, don't say anything to worry, and we'll just make it worse, you know. So mom was very dutiful, she'd go up there in the morning to visit him, everything's fine, everything's fine, in the afternoon, everything's fine, everything's fine, but she was out of money, and just about out of gas, and uh, so she took the last of the bread and jam in the house, made sandwiches of bread and jam for us kids, drove up in the morning, saw dad, said, oh, everything's fine, everything, kept the car there, because she only had enough gas to get home. And all day we played in the park, and then we ate bread and jam sandwiches. And then she drove us home after visiting Dad in the afternoon. So, so regularly you were visiting him twice every day? Yeah, she was. Yeah. And I don't think kids were allowed up there then. Where and was that uh, hospital at? I don't remember. This was, we were in Richmond, so somewhere in there. I was just a toddler. Well, know, some, some of these locations you talk about knowing even when you're late, older later. But uh, anyway, and then she got home this day and looked through all the pantries and all she could come up with was one can of something green. And the reason we had it is nobody liked it. it probably asparagus or some nasty thing like that. And, uh, and she had no gas in the car. Her rent was... <laughs> this gets, uh, it's, it's touching. Her rent was past due. And she looked at all us kids who looked at her and said, What's for dinner, Mom? We're hungry. Those jam and bread sandwiches didn't go very far. And as she's looking at that, I'm wondering what to do. Remember, my mom was a very strong woman. I've told you some of the stories of her when she was younger. And uh, uh, there was a knock at the door. And she went there. And, and a man came to the door and uh, said, are you uh, Sister Child? Well, she hadn't been addressed as Sister Child for a long time. They were totally inactive. And she said, uh, yeah. He says, well, I'm Bishop so-and-so. I don't know the bishop's name. He says, I understand you have a your husband's in the hospital and uh, you could use some help. Excuse me. Well, uh, he brought in bags of groceries, made multiple trips no. from his car to the house with uh, groceries, and then wrote out a check. Says you'll need uh, money for gas and for your rent, and uh, saved our family. So that's my. Uh, Always my home teaching story when I can manage to get it out to the brethren when we 
our pride ourselves on getting 80% home teaching. That might sound good, but what if my mom was the 20%? So, anyway, when uh, Dad got out of the hospital, things had changed at home. Remember I told you my mom was strong. My dad became active whether he wanted to or not <laughs> from that point on. Mom made sure of that. And uh, he's tried long and hard to repay the debt by serving the church with his truck and stuff, but some debts are too large to repay. And that's one of them. But from that old war housing, we, Dad established the trucking company with, uh, oh, before he established the trucking company, he was an owner-operator for this company, uh, Stuart Dredge. Uh, that used to be the common reference to trucking was Dredge. And uh, he was an owner-operator buying his truck from Stuart, who was kind of a crook. But eventually my dad got his truck paid off, and uh, he was going to leave Stuart because he didn't like the way he did things. And, and my uncle Sid worked there, and he was buying his truck too, although it wasn't quite paid off. He said, well, I'm leaving too. And they left at the same time and started their trucking company. Here, Jacob, down here. So they were trying to figure out what to Where call their a, okay. trucking company. So, wait, who is who is uh, Grandpa's partner? Uh, Sid Rain, my mom's brother. Okay, so it's so it's Grandpa's brother-in-law. Yeah, his brother-in-law. Rod's brother. Huh? Rod, no, Rod, I'm sorry. Uh, my Jay. mom's Jay's, Jay's brother. Jay's brother. And my mom's brother. Anyway, but. They, uh, they couldn't afford a whole new paint job on the truck, so they had to, when they left Stuart, he'd painted out his name, it was in a circle, you know? and so they had this circle on their doors, they had to come up with some name that fit that, and Dad said, you know, if we're in the trucking business, we're stuck behind the eight ball, which if we play pool, you know, is a bad place to be, and Sid didn't like the name, but when dad, they didn't come to a consensus, and Dad had to go down and register, so he registered it as eight ball trucking. And they painted that ball black and put two little men behind it, stuck behind the eight ball, Sid and Howard. And uh, then they, uh, they were making pretty good money hauling fruit, it was that time of year, and they had flatbed trailers. And they, Are you still using the computer? When they worked for Stewart, Dredge, Stewart had this account at uh, a Certainty Roofing. Well, the people at Stewart Dredge went on strike. And the people from Certainty came to Dad and said, Would you and Sid do our hauling for us? Because Stewart can't get any of his trucks out. And uh, Dad said, I don't know, we're doing pretty good hauling fruity. They said, If you do this, we'll take care of you. So they did, and uh, they eventually were the in-house carriers for Certainty Roofing. They took it away from that crook steward. And uh, it uh, lasted for many a year there. And it was about that time uh, that the folks had moved into Point Richmond, up on the hill, had a great view of everything down below. And so, Dad and Sid would be down working on their trucks, and if a call came in for a load, Mom would take the big red throw rug and throw it over the banister, and they'd look up and see that. They'd run on up and find out about the load and go take care of it. The original cell phone was a red throw rug over the banister. And uh, so that's how that business got started. We lived there. Uh, well, did you tell them how they had to pick eight ball name? Yeah, yeah. I did. Okay. The, uh, so, so is that where you, that house that you're talking about on the hill, is that where you moved from the, the, from the government housing? Yeah. From the war housing? I did not hear okay. how eight ball got its name. I've never heard that story. But, uh, 
anyway, they, um, I'm, I'm thinking I lived there until I started high school. Uh, then my folks moved across town. They had to get a place that they could accommodate grandma around. Because this house on the hill, we had to go up all these stairs to get up there. It's all right if we're young, but grandma had a cane. And it was, took her forever to get up there or down. So, and, uh... Mom would take her piggyback up and down the stairs. Yeah. So she would, so your mom would carry her mom on her back? No. Yes. Did, did she? Yes. Oh, okay, well, I didn't hear that. Well, it's only fair considering that she at one point carried her on her front. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my first day of high school, Ron dropped me off. Uh, he was four years older than me, so he was, uh, I think he was then a senior at the school across town from where I was going. And because uh, he was going there when we moved. He dropped me off and he gave the evil eye to a couple of guys that said, you better take care of my brother. <laughs> but uh, anyway, then I, we eventually moved across town, like I said, to Doremus Avenue. So I grew up in Richmond, went to, uh, back to BYU from, from there. and on my mission from there, and then while I was on my mission, my folks moved to Walnut Creek. Fortunately, I found out where they lived, so they couldn't ditch me <laughs> when I came off my mission. But uh, that's when uh, Mom started to try to feel more sophisticated, because this Walnut Creek ward was really different. It was full of executives. It was a real expensive area. And uh, like the uh, elders quorum president would have been a, an attorney, the high priest group leader was a CEO over a major company, all that, you know. I was there. Take like our stake. Yeah. <laughs> I was there for, uh, Sylvia and I, for six months while they were building our house in Vallejo. We stayed at the folks' house. And there wasn't anything there for me to do. I don't even think they gave me a home teaching assignment. <laughs> I mean, I was a truck driver, for heaven's sakes, you know? Uh, it was a strange sort of place. Is that when you got your job at Certainty? My job at Certainty? Oh, yeah. that's years before then. Oh, that was... I, I went to work at Certainty when I was out of high school. I, uh, I was 17 when I graduated from high school. And I, I, w I looked all over trying to find a job, couldn't, couldn't find, finally I came down to eight ball and I was talking to Sid who was dispatching and I said, I can't find a job anywhere. And so he said, just a minute, he made a phone call out to Certainty and I was hired there the next day. He told him I was 18. They didn't check things then. And, uh, Is that the, the roofing company? Yeah, the roofing company. The one that that's told your dad that they, they'd take care of it. Yeah. And uh, an interesting development there. Of course, I was one of the guys that loaded the the rail cars. You, the the rolled roofing was loaded by hand, so you'd put in a couple thousand rolls of roofing there, and three high, and stack it, fill that thing up, and then you unload at the other side incoming stuff like hundred pound bags of who knows what that they use in their processes. It was a lot of labor. And one day we're hefting these big bags, and the foreman comes in and says, do any of you know how to drive a forklift? Well, we had an old forklift that eight ball I used to power, drive around for fun as a kid. I said, I do. I said, well, come on. I dropped that bag and made me a forklift driver. That was the top job at Certainty. And you know, I, uh, I thought uh, I, I was, Real happy with that for a while. I mean, I got two dollars and ninety-two cents an hour, top wages in the fifties then. And uh, after a while of driving there and looking at the other guys, I realized this: if I stay here, this is the best it's going to get. 
I got guys here have been here 30 years driving a forklift. I'm making the same as them. And I'm I'm not quite 18 years old, you know? What future is there here? That's when I decided I needed an education. So my friends were graduating from high school and going back to BYU and I wanted to go but my grades weren't good enough so I I went to the junior college for a semester and got my grades up and then uh, then I I went back to the Y. It was easier then. You could go to the Y, you know, and uh, they weren't overbooked like they are these days. Was it working at the roofing company? I think you told one story about like there's like this old guy when you're doing the unloading yeah. and loading, and there's like some older guy there who uh, I, I I I seem to remember you talking about like yeah. you, you egged them on about something, and so he just kind of like let you do more of the more of the work. Uh, no, I didn't egg anyone on. This guy, I was on for a while on the production side where the shingles would come down a conveyor. Now they're loaded by machine, but then you had to pick them off and stack them. And the guy in the middle was supposed to take a certain amount, and the guy on the end took the rest. And I was the guy on the end. And this guy would turn around and talk to his friends, and I'm frantically trying to keep up, you know. And he just laughed at me. He thought that was funny. I, I remember that much of it, but uh, it was uh, one thing back when I was a kid lumping those loads, everything's out of sequence here, you know, but one day uh, when I was 14, I went out with the first driver to San Jose, San Jose was just starting to build up then, it, it, the first tract homes were going in, knocking down orchards and building houses. And uh, I'd help him unload the load, and then he left me there. And the next one come in, I'd help him. At the end of the day, the last driver I helped would take me home. And uh, I did six loads that day in the sun, hot. And uh, I made $5 a load, so I made $30 that day. And that was a man's wage then. That was as good as it got for a laborer those days. And uh, I went home, cleaned up, went to bed, woke up in the morning and I couldn't move. I couldn't move one of my arms or legs. They, they were locked in place They're from the muscles tightening up overnight. I had to roll out of bed and fall on the floor to get things moving. But uh, I built up a lot of upper body strength by uh, lifting 80-pound bundles of shingles and up to 110-pound rolls of roofing and 100-pound kegs of asphalt. Tell them about the nuke. Some of those, some of those drivers were really good though. We'd go to a place and we had that load on their dock in there. We have a load of 100-pound kegs of asphalt. He'd say, you stand there and just, if I miss one, you stand it up. He would toss them, flip them, poof, right in watch like that, you know. Once in a while one would bounce out and I'd set it up again before he hit me at the next one, you know. And just, it was some of those guys, you know, they'd been using their their muscles doing that sort of stuff for years and years. This is before places had forklifts like they do now. How many more minutes Adam's had? I ate all my hands. If a place had a forklift, that was very unusual. And you want me to tell about what? The nuke. What nuke? Uh, he saw a nuke. When, oh, yeah. when Mom took you to see the one they're testing the bombs. Yeah, well, she didn't take me very far. When we lived up on that hill, they used to test nukes out in the desert above ground. I knew it. And uh, they, on the radio, they'd have a countdown so you could listen for it. And she got me up early one morning, and half asleep. And said, Look out here now. Turn up the radio, listen to the countdown. And the, the explosion went off on the. This is in Nevada, and we're in California. The whole room would just light up like a big flashbulb. Like that. You could almost hear it stop. And, Whoa, you know? I mean, talk about the power of a nuclear bomb. And those were probably teeny ones compared to what they have now. But uh, that's when they were still testing above ground. So I can say I saw a nuclear explosion. That was... Uh, I don't know why my mom got me up and not the rest. You know, maybe she loved you more. 
She loved her. She loved him a little less. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was the, the middle blue eyed child. I was. There were seven kids. At least you were redhead. Yeah, I was the end of the first four. That's why you were blue eyed because you were watching all the nuclear. <laughs> I guess I was the only blue eyed kid out of seven. My my brothers and sisters would torment me. They would start oh, singing when we we're driving along somewhere with the family and say. Beautiful, beautiful brown eyes, and I'd scream, blue eyes, blue eyes. <laughs> we'll never love blue eyes again. I say, brown eyes, brown eyes. You know, they they tormented me a lot. The big, the yeah, big. But you were spoiled. Nah, Jesus. it couldn't have been spoiled with make believe bologna sandwiches. And... Oh, well, first of all, chocolate milk was the premium. Oh, that was the most wonderful thing you could have. And every so often, Mom would get chocolate milk. Well, I got home late. They had drunk. Maxine, Linda, and Ron had drunk all the chocolate milk. And they knew I was supposed to get some. So they made this concoction that looked like it. I don't know what was in it. But they gave it to me. And, ah, chocolate milk. And I started to drink that. Gag. Oh, it was nasty. Awful stuff. You know, they laughed, laughed. I thought that was funny. You know, but... Uh, the, Maxine would get mad at me and take a swipe at me with her her uh, big long fingernails and break one off in me and just got madder at me because she broke her fingernail off of my arm. You know? <laughs> but, what, what were you mentioning? Uh, the pretend bologna sandwiches. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I guess things were tight a lot there because... When uh, I remember Linda and I, we wanted a bologna sandwich, but there wasn't any bologna in the house. There wasn't any kind of meat. But there was lettuce and mayonnaise and mustard, so we put mayonnaise, mustard, lettuce, salt and pepper, and we had pretend bologna sandwiches. Pretend. <laughs> so that was... Uh, and Mom would make this, uh, like, Italian dressing with vinegar and that. And... Linda and I would always argue and fight over who got to drink the stuff at the bottom after the salad was on. Oh. We loved it. That's disgusting. <laughs> we were sitting around the table one time. This is before the second bunch of kids came along. And Dad's home from work. Mom puts a plate in front of him. He looks down and says, What's this slop? Just joking. She takes his head <laughs> right into it. <laughs> Whatever it was, was all over his face. I guess Dad was a heck of a good sport because I never heard any profanity or anything from that. But uh, when they were young uh, and uh, hadn't been married too long, Dad would come home from work and be before the, I don't know, it's probably before us kids came along, I don't know, but he would get in the bathtub and and uh, take a bath and then fall asleep in the hot water. And then mom would wake him up and he'd get up, dry off and go to bed. Well, she was mad at him this one time and she did not wake him up. He woke up in the middle of the night freezing to death. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah. You don't want mom mad at you. you know? Mom knew how to get even. Any of us. <laughs> Pumpkin pie <laughs> used to be my favorite when I was a kid, and uh, Mom would bake up some pumpkin pie. She'd put one out there and cut it into fours and give each of us four kids a quarter piece. And I looked at mine and I looked at one of the other kids. His is bigger than mine. Mom did snap. Ah, she got another pie, cut it, put two or three more pieces on mine, says, eat it. Ah, oh, great, you know. I started eating it, got about halfway done. I said, I'm going to save the rest for later. Eat it. <laughs> I don't like the crust. Eat them. Uh, I, to this day, I don't much care for pumpkin pie anymore. <laughs> when your parents were first married, I think they were living in Blue Water, Mexico, um, I don't know exactly what they're living on, but they... Blue Water, New Mexico. New Mexico, thank you. And uh, all they had was like a bed. I don't know if they had any other furniture, but they had a suitcase. And they put the suitcase on the bed between them, and that would be their table. And they would have dinner. And, they, you know, what's for dinner? Oh, and she'd name all this stuff, and then she'd just laugh, and they'd have porridge or something similar, <laughs> some kind of a soup. 
and uh, she says that they, whenever they could catch the cow, they were allowed to milk it and keep the milk. And she said it was great until it got into the wild onions and it really flavored the milk. <laughs> that little, that dugout, it was a dugout they lived in. Dad, Dad worked on the railroad and they were just married. I remember she was 14 when she got married. And he takes her to this dugout. She goes in there and there's snakes in it. <laughs> she screamed out there. Dad had to go chase all the snakes out. And but how old is, was your dad? 21 when they got married. They had like seven years between them. But uh, those were, they lived on some hard scrabble times. They were... What decade would that have been? In the 30s. Yeah. The Depression. Yeah, during the Depression. Oh, so it was acceptable. Dad oh. had come out to San Francisco to find work from, uh, I think they were living in Wyoming then or something like that. And, uh, That's where he met Mom. He met Mom in San Francisco. Uh, Mom and her mother and father lived in San Francisco. He was my grandfather was a carpenter. I never met Grandpa Rain. And uh, she would tell a story about going to uh, going to school. She was in trouble with the nuns at school. Oh. And so and she told me she never could could sew. She couldn't do handwork. She had a lot of other talents, but that wasn't her talent. And she had her teacher and her sister had a lot of talents. She made that uh, that white satin blanket that's at the end of our bed now. Uh, at any rate, and she says she sometimes would try to make her projects worse than she could have because the men would hold it up and say, this is Della's idea of sewing, and she'd show it to well, everybody. Happy more minutes so. it but that Elijah wasn't among her talents. Are you going to tell about how she got married? No, no, not yet. Oh, okay. This, uh, so as a little girl, she'd get in trouble with the nuns and have to go bring her father to see them. So she'd get her dad, Grandpa Rain, and as they're walking to school, she'd tell him all the bad things about the nuns and everything, get him so worked up by the time he got there, he was screaming at the nuns. <laughs> he was abusing his daughter, you know. I guess it worked. But when... Um, when she was 14, she met my dad. I'm not sure yeah. how they met. Do you remember yeah. some? Oh, no, but I do remember when yeah. he proposed. Do you go when dad to came out there to work, he moved in with his uh, uh, stepsister and someone else, and they let him sleep in the closet while he looked for work. Mm -hmm. While he was looking for work, this is during the Depression, and he was just farm boy looking for work. He was walking down San Francisco and asking people, where could I find work? This one smart dude says, oh, they're hiring down at the wharves. Well, there was a big strike going. And it was death to try to cross those lines at the wharves in those days. And the longshoreman would kill you. And he went down there and asking about work and that. And he, he knew something wasn't right. So he, he came out, got on a trolley, and was heading back, and this car pulled in front of the trolley and stopped it. And these big dudes got out, got on the trolley, and looked at him, said, you're looking for work. <laughs> he thought he was going to die right then, you know. And uh, I don't know how he got out of it. They let him go, thank goodness. And uh, or you wouldn't be born. <laughs> yeah. So he had, he had other different jobs. He worked at a laundry and uh, things like that. But, uh, well, where he was working, when, I think he was working with Jay Rain, and I think that's how he got acquainted with your mom, through her brother. I'm sure it was through one of the brothers. Yeah. There was Uncle Jay, Uncle Edgar, and Sid, and... Uh, Lester. Lester. Mm -hmm. Lester was the coolest one of the bunch. He looked like Clark Gable. And Is that who Uncle Lester was named after? Mm -hmm. Probably. And uh, he went over to Saudi Arabia and worked on the oil fields and that, and sent back pictures of all these human parts hanging up for thieves. They had their hands cut off and were hung up there. And stuff like that. Gruesome pictures. And uh, 
But Uncle Lester came back. He 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 was an alcoholic, and he'd get very depressed. And uh, he, I would go over and visit his wife at that time because she made these super neat muffins. Uh, and uh, she'd put me in the car, and they'd go. She'd go driving around to different bars to try to find them. And uh, one day, Uncle Lester committed suicide taking a bunch of pills because he got so depressed. And uh, so we missed him because he was, of all the reins, he was the slickest one of all, I think. To a certain point. How much family did uh, did Grandma have uh, for, for all these brothers the she had? were just her and her sister. Four brothers and then two girls. Yeah. What was her sister's name? It was uh, Vernetta. Vernetta had ten children. She had eight boys. No, she had seven boys, two girls, and then one more boy. Runs in the family, I guess. Yeah, I can't blame anybody else. And then, and so then she had four brothers. You mentioned Lester, you mentioned Jay, and Sid, and, Sid, Sid, and Edgar. Edgar. Edgar married this Mexican gal. And we would go over there and eat Mexican food that she had made. I don't think she spoke very good English. It was an interesting home to go to because of the food and everything. Uh, so how did your father propose to your mom actually well, get to that point? Well, what happened, uh, my mom was 14 years old and obviously well-developed. She could get into the bars without showing any ID. Her older brothers had to show their ID, and they would always get angry. But she didn't have to, you know. Um, you know it's me. And uh, so, I, I, Dad must have met Mom through one of her brothers, and uh, they dated, and he he uh, really liked her and everything. And remember, Mom's only fourteen, but she was uh, washing windows or something up on a ladder, and Dad came over. And, and talked to uh, Grandma Rain, Grandma her, Rain mother. her mother, and wanted to marry well, Mom. Well, he, his dad was moving down to New Mexico, and he wanted to take Mom with him. He didn't want to give her up. Wait, whose dad was moving? My dad's. My grandfather child was. Yeah, Grandpa Child. That, uh, what was... William Child. William Warren Child. Right. And so... Dad wanted to take her with yeah. him. Yeah, Howard Child went to the Rain home so and wanted to take Della. Mom's up there washing the window listening to this, and Grandma Rain was thinking about it and thought she'd better marry her off before she got into trouble. And she was kind of a wild so, child. So she said, okay, and Mom's up there said, oh, I think I'm getting married. Mom just said I was getting married. <laughs> so, well, how did her parents react to that? That was, well, her, that was her mother. No. So yeah, marry her. I guess that's in the era when it was most common to seek the parents' permission before marrying someone. Maybe. Oh yeah. And probably because she was so young. Well, definitely, be sure. Well, and it was also during you know Depression era era time, so and it was they were a lot older, younger than you know you were yeah. fourteen. And you had to mature fast. A lot more mature. Yeah. Had a lot more responsibilities, and at some point, mom and dad were way out somewhere, and they were trying to get into California. And he got this old car, and the the rods were knocking and everything. So he took them down, put bacon rind on the rods, and put them back up. Bacon rind? Yeah, it's act as a bearing, and uh, like food. Yeah, from from a pig. Bacon <laughs> rind, really tough stuff. Tightened it up and it ran. So, uh, and it didn't have a window in the driver's side. It was broken out. So, mom made one out of cardboard that they could roll up, you know, and down. He was real proud of that. And they drove that from wherever they were quite a ways, you know. They they didn't have enough money for gas. So they had to stop and try to earn some money in this and that. And uh, they, they tell about, they gave this one guy a ride and he was boasting about he was important at this lumber yard and could get dad a job and everything. And uh, 
he took him there and the guy was drinking all the time. And they got there and he he took them into the cafeteria and they got fed all this good food and that. And uh, I think the guy passed out or something and dad started asking about the job. And these guys said, there's no jobs here. He says, when he wakes up, he's going to have to pay for all this food you ate and everything else. <laughs> So they got in their car and took off, and uh, it was quite a trip. I don't remember all the details uh, to check with my other brothers and sisters. They have more, I'm sure. This, that's, that's the trip they make just when they were proposed? No, after they were married a right. short while, they'd worked out here somewhere, and now they were getting out of the dugout with the snakes, I guess, coming back to Utah. That's all I can figure. But as I've been mean, coming, coming back to California, uh, but they stopped along the way. There was a, a peach orchard. They ran out, and picked all these peaches they could, and ate them forever, getting stomach aches and everything. And the peaches weren't totally ripe anyway. And uh, he says when they finally got into San Francisco to her mother's house. They didn't even say hi. They just rushed into the refrigerator, started eating. They were half starved. And uh, this uh, this window with the cardboard, though. I guess Dad's father took the car once, and it was raining, and he rolled up that cardboard window, and it ruined it. And Mom never forgave him for ruining her cardboard window. <laughs> I, I just remember bits and pieces, you know. But and then I told you about about the motorcycle they had for transportation, the big Indian Ford. Yeah, why don't you tell about the motorcycle again? Because I didn't have the camera here for that one. Yeah, they Dad had this big Indian four, a four-cylinder motorcycle, biggest one, bigger than anything Harley had, and uh, they'd drive that around and. When Maxine was born, they'd put her between the two of them on the motorcycle and drive all around. And uh, at one point, well, they, uh, Dad and uh, Jay used to go out on the on Van Ness Avenue, the big long four lane road straight, and they'd come up alongside a police car and go boom, 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 rev it up and take off, make the police car chase them just so they could outrun them, you know, <laughs> crazy. And uh, he said they'd go so fast that that Van Ness Avenue came from four lanes down to a, a stripe, you know, tunnel vision going that fast. But uh, one day, uh, Dad loaned it to a guy, he took off and never came back, so he never saw his Indian motorcycle again. Wasn't it like just at a bar, somebody at a yeah. bar that just wanted to take it around the block or something? Yep. Could be something like that. That that's what I just remember you saying. Yeah, they used to they used to go out drinking and all that all the time. And, uh, like I say, they weren't they weren't uh, following the tenets of the church that they'd grown up in, both of them. But uh, uh, again, remember things were different in the depression. Then when the war came along, Dad got a job. He had two different jobs that I know of. Just real quick, how, when they lost the Indian, how many children did they have? Just Maxine. Just Maxine, okay. Uh, while they were in San Francisco, they bought this lot up on the hill. A knob hill. A, sandy, a sand lot. And it didn't, I think it would cost them $24 or something. They were paying it off a couple dollars every month. And things got tight and they let it go. And they just wonder how much that thing would have been worth <laughs> then, you know, later after the war when San Francisco got so big. It would have been a Not horrendous Hill was a high-priced area. Oh, it is now. What was, but, what was San Francisco then, back then, if it wasn't... It was a big town, but it wasn't like it is now, you know? It's all full of rich yuppies, I guess. Yeah. But, yuppies uh, that became yuppies. That's yeah. There, that's the point. I'll have to Puppies. tell you about delivering eggs to Haight Ashbury when I did that. But uh, Dad had two jobs that I know of during the war. 
that exempt them from the military because they were necessary for the war effort. One, he was a welder, and they were building ships and welding with uh, they they used just they didn't have wire feeds and they just had rod welding they would weld and the they, it was a, the whole process was a cost plus ten percent so as much as it cost the contractor they made ten percent more so they wanted to make it as expensive as possible and dad would say how they would take fifty pound boxes of brand new welding rod and throw it out in the bay so they could raise up the costs. See. And they were down in the hold of a ship welding one day and a guy came up and laid down and he died. Whoa! You know, they, they instituted a whole bunch of new regulations for that because they were getting, you know, too hot down there trying to work and not so enough air. Died of like heat stroke? Probably. Oh. Something like Your that. Dad? No. Not my dad. Oh, no. He was just, working down there and somebody else came down and died. And later he became uh, a journeyman driller. So they're building aircraft carriers and he had to drill holes through the deck. Now he got plates 16 inches thick of steel, you know, they have on these, these warships. And he'd have to drill a very precise hole and he'd have to sharpen his bits all the time. Drill so far, then pull out, sharpen it, and then drill. So it was a, a, a pretty uh, intensive job, I guess, you know. They didn't have the machines they have today. There was a lot of measuring and reckoning done. But uh, I know he had those, those two jobs, so he never had to go to war. Which is why they could still have a family, have children, when a lot of people, there's a big gap that they didn't have children because the husband was gone, but dad was home, so... During which time, family. of course, you were born. Yeah, I Please. was... He was born I, in 1945. He was still during the war. Yeah. I was the last of the first four of my parents' kids. Then there was like nine eight, years. Eight years. You were eight years old when Susan yeah, was born. Yeah, not when she was born. When she, she got pregnant with Susan because there was nine years. She was ten. I was 19 when I went on my mission. Okay. So, ironically, it's when the baby boom started that your parents stopped having babies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they had three more later. And uh, Susie was the, the daughter who uh, was just younger than me. Uh, by nine years. By nine years. And when she was three and a half years old, they discovered that she had leukemia. And uh, again, leukemia was not well understood or anything. And uh, they had about four different drugs they could give her to, to keep her alive. But she'd build up a resistance, so they would switch to another one. And I can remember one set of drugs made her put on all this weight, she got real fat which wasn't normal for her. And, uh, but it was a hard time for the family because it was so hard on mom and dad, their little girl dying, because she was in the hospital and her nose started bleeding and she went into a coma. They said she wouldn't live through the night. And uh, Dad and uh, Bishop came, <coughs> gave her a blessing. Her nose stopped bleeding. She came out of the coma and she lived for another seven years. And they said that's, she's down in the books as medical uh, history. It should not have happened. Even after she came out of the coma, they said, she's going to die, we can't save her. But she lived for seven years. And like I say, it was hard on the family because they spoiled her so bad, as you can understand. But it was hard for me to understand as a young kid. Well, they spoiled her, but Mom always said that they didn't because she didn't ever act spoiled. She didn't throw any fits or anything like a spoiled child. 
but they did like if they all went out for ice cream and if she wanted a, a malt or a sundae or something while everybody else was just having a cone, she was allowed to have what she wanted when other people didn't get to have that same item. We should tell how, uh, how Susie came to be. Came to be? Yep. There was David who was about eight years old and he was in the prime of his life and Mrs. Brown loved him and <laughs> took care of him. But who was Mrs. Brown? I'll tell you about Mrs. Brown in a minute. Oh. Yeah, but anyway, oh, later I know where this is going. The the three older kids got together, especially the two girls. And they went to mom and they said, We need to have another baby and it's going to be a little girl and we're going to name her Susie. And mom was just floored. <laughs> but they, they said okay, they agreed, and she did. She got pregnant, she had a little girl, and they named her Susie. Susan Lynn. Well, when Mom worked out of uh, that war housing, she had a job. She needed someone to take care of me, because I was too young for school. So she hired Mrs. Brown, a black lady, right from Arkansas, I believe. And uh, Mrs. Brown took care of me. And we moved up to Point Richmond, she took care of me there. And she was like a second mother to me. Uh, we would go, she'd make peanut butter and jam sandwiches and send me to the store to come back with a couple of bottles of old-fashioned mug root beer. We'd go hiking up into the